Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into this beautiful book of Kings today. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today. 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 9. And in our last lecture, we saw uh, Solomon uh, touching base with Hiram, the king of Tyre, uh, lining up. Uh, supplies that they were going to need, materials that they were going to need uh, to build the house of God, Solomon's temple. And Hiram uh, heard what they needed and said, okay, I'll hire the Phoenicians who are very knowledgeable in selecting the trees, the best trees, and cutting the trees, and then how to care for the wood as it's transported. And we ended our last lecture with Hiram sending to Solomon saying, we can meet your needs, whatever you need, it's there for you. So uh, the preparation continues for the building of the temple. And, and keep in mind too that uh, David uh, also was allowed to gather materials for the temple. He just wasn't allowed to build the temple why? Because he was a man that had shed a lot of blood on the earth. Much of that necessary to uh, bring the enemies of Israel under their feet uh, so that they could enjoy a time of peace and prosperity, uh, a time of building such as uh, the building of God's house. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name, Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick up uh, studying the letter that you wrote to us, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 9, and it reads, My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea. And they're here we're talking about the trees uh, that were going to be cut, uh, the cedars of Lebanon, as well as the fir trees, probably cypress, better said, mentioned in verse 8. And I will convey them by sea in floats. This word floats it means to bind together as rafts, if you will, unto the place that thou shalt appoint me, and will cause them to be discharged there. This word discharged in the Hebrew, nafatz, and it means literally to take apart. In other words, the trees were bound together in large rafts, uh, floated on the Mediterranean Sea, and then when they arrived in close to Jerusalem, they took them apart. And thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household, and uh, trading food supplies for the trees, for the temple. In uh, Second Chronicles, uh, we learn that uh, the location where these trees, the rafts, were floated to was Joppa, uh, which lies 30 to 35 miles west of Jerusalem and is the seaport uh, for Jerusalem even unto this day, uh, lies on the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 10, so Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. Whatever you need, uh, we will send. Verse 11, And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures, these are cores in the, the Hebrew language, a core is equal to approximately eight bushels of wheat for food to his household and twenty measures of pure oil, thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year." So uh, throughout the course of a year, these amounts were delivered. In Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 10, it's a different uh, measurement uh, amount, but it's not a, uh, a contradiction. This 
the, the amounts here are for the king's household there in Second Chronicles. It's for the laborers uh, who are cutting the wood. <clears throat> 20 measures of pure oil. This pure oil means it's the finest oil. It's, it's taken from olives that are not quite yet ripe and it produces a, a lighter colored oil and, and a purer oil at that. Verse 12, And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him. Chapter 3, verse 12, And the wisdom he gave him in obtaining these materials and uh, the skilled laborers uh, to put it all together, which we're going to be talking about in the next several verses. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they too made a league together, a covenant and a contract. The, the agreement was good for both parties. Solomon was uh, getting the trees he needed, the material for a, a good part of the house of God, and in return, Hiram was getting food, uh, supplies, and oil uh, products for his household. Verse 13, And King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel, and the levy was 30,000 men. Now, this word levy, check it out in the Hebrew, is mas. And it's like a tax or a tribute, but it's for labor. And these, these people are Israelites, and they're not slaves, but, and these people, the, the, the levy that Solomon was placing on the tribes of Israel became part of the reason for the split in the nation. Uh, they weren't real happy about continually uh, 30,000 men having to go work uh, for the government, basically, and, and they probably weren't paid all that much. I think that's where the term came up during the time of Jeroboam when they rebelled against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, they said nomos, that being the, the word Hebrew. Now, you know, God knew that this was going to happen before it happened. And let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, Israel was saying, we want a man king. And God said, you know, uh, we want to be like the other heathen nations and have a man king that we can see. And through the, the prophet Samuel, uh, God told the people of Israel what a king would do. And uh, as always, God was right. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 10. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. You see, he wanted to be the king of Israel. Uh, he didn't want uh, the, 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 the people selecting just anybody. Verse 11, And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. He's going to draft your children to be in his army. This uh, having your sons run before his chariots, I couldn't help but think of Absalom and Adoniah uh, trying to take the throne of God. You know, a man king could would be a good king if he would totally submit to the will of God. Uh, they didn't, uh, unfortunately. Time after time, their own self-will became more important than the will of God. I tell you this, though, we have a king coming in the not-so-distant future that uh, will uh, uh, submit totally to the will of God. Uh, he is the King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Verse 12. And he will appoint him, the, the king, man king, captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground. The word ear is an old Anglo-Saxon uh, word that means to plow and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war 
and instruments of his chariots. Your, your sons will do the king's bidding. They, and whatever he wants, that's what your children will do. And he will take your daughters. He's not only going to take your sons, but he's going to take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. The king will control all. Not only is he going to take your sons, he's going to put your daughters to work as confectionaries, which means perfumers, if you will, and cooks and bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. You're not going to be able to enjoy the fruits of your labors. You're going to work hard to get the vineyards and the olive yards ready, and then the king is going to take the best of them for himself and his servants. This came to pass with Ahab, uh, and he had a neighbor whose name was Naboth, and he was envious of Naboth's vineyard. Uh, he wasn't as evil as his wife Jezebel. He went home one day and uh, he was acting real pouty. And Jezebel said, what's wrong? And he said, well, Naboth won't give me his vineyard. I wanted his vineyard. And she goes, you're the king. If you want his vineyard, take it. And she made up false uh, charges against uh, Naboth and his sons. They were all murdered and uh, Ahab got Naboth's vineyard. He paid, verse 15. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers, this is actually in the Hebrew eunuchs, and to his servants. He's going to tax you and, and give the, the, the fruits of your labor to others. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. You ask for a man king, uh, you deserve what you get. He will take the tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. No longer again will you be able to reap the fruits of your labors. He's going to take them and give them to others. Verse 18. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. You turned your back on God. Uh, he's going to turn his back on you. And we're going to go back to 1 Kings at this point. But uh, Samuel would go on to tell them the, the word of the Lord, which was, you know, you're, you're looking for someone, you think a king is going to fight your battles for you. Uh, he's going to take your sons and put them in his army, and you're going to fight the enemies, not the king. Back to 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 14. And he sent, this is uh, uh, Solomon, of course, them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by courses. These are the 30,000 mentioned in the previous verse. So what they would do is go to Lebanon to cut trees for one month, 10,000 of them. Then they would come home and another 10,000 would go. And then every uh, fourth month you would be back in Lebanon cutting trees. By courses or teams, a month they were in Lebanon and two months at home, and Adoniram was over the levy. He was over the tribute, if you will. The men rotated onto duty one month. Can you imagine how many man hours that is? 10,000 men cutting wood for a month, and then another 10,000 taking their place. Again, this was a big part of the reason for the split of the nation while Solomon's son Rehoboam was king. The people were being taxed and levies placed upon them that were unbearable. Verse 15, And Solomon had threescore and ten thousand that bear burdens, seventy thousand. 
and fourscore thousand hewers in the mountains, 80,000 uh, cutting stone in the mountains or in the quarries. You know, uh, Solomon was given credit for building the house of God, but he had a lot of help. 70,000 uh, and 80,000, that's 150,000 workers. That's not all, verse 16. A big part of these, the 150,000 just mentioned, were descendants of the Canaanites that were left in the land and they became forced labor. Verse 16, beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, 3,300 which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. We had 3,300 supervisors over the 150,000 laborers mentioned in verse 15. Now, these were supervisors of the first rank. Uh, there are another 550 supervisors, as we'll learn in chapter 9, verse 23, that were of a higher rank, and most of them were uh, Israelites, verse 17. And the king commanded, and they brought or quarried great stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. And not only the house, but also the uh, areas around the house of God, they would have put foundations. Now, these huge stones were dressed stones. Uh, we're going to learn in the next chapter that they didn't allow hammers or stone axes, the sound of that to be heard at the actual building site of the temple. So uh, these stones had to be cut uh, precisely and then uh, transported to Jerusalem uh, to be placed in place. Can you imagine uh, the, the, the complications of having to, to prepare the stones at one site, transport them, and then put them together, and they'd have to fit almost perfectly. And they had some folks that were very skilled to do this. We learn about them in verse 18. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them, and the stone squarers, uh, so they prepared timber and stones to build the house. Now these stone squares, uh, check that word out in the Hebrew, it's gibal, and it's, it's a location, it's a location about 40 miles north of Sidon. The inhabitants of gibal, known as giblites, were very skillful builders. They specialized especially in building ships uh, but they were uh, responsible for making sure that the stones uh, were prepared and the wood also prepared properly uh, to be transported to Jerusalem to build the temple. In chapter 6, the preparations have been made, the plans laid, the contracts uh, agreed upon between Solomon and Hiram and now the actual building of the house of God, the temple, uh, begins to take place. And, and imagine what a time of joy this was in Jerusalem. Uh, for decades, centuries, uh, the temple had been a tent made of goat hair uh, because Israel was a nomadic people. They traveled from here to there. Uh, but then now God promised them that he was going to bring them into a land that flows with milk and honey and that if they would keep his covenant that he would live among them. And now we're going to see, uh, imagine when the people looked and they saw this building coming into to reality, no longer a temporary transportable tent, but a, a permanent a fixed building uh, that would be the house of God. Chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, 
in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph, which is the second month. Ziph means literally blooming. It's equivalent to approximately our month of May, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, most scholars agree that Israel came out of Egypt in the year 1490 B.C. Now, there's a great deal of disagreement as to what year we are at now from that. Uh, if you have a companion Bible, uh, Bullinger states that he puts this year that the temple actually began being built in 917 uh, B.C. And there's a, a 93 years that the nation was in abeyance. In other words, during the time of the judges, there wasn't always a judge over Israel. The people would turn away from God and he would totally turn his back on them. And so they kind of lost track of the years through that period of time is the point that Bullinger makes. Verse 2. And the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. Now, a cubit was, depending on whose measure you went by, anywhere between twenty-one and twenty-five inches. So if you'll allow me to use uh, an easy to figure uh, 24 inches to the cubit, two feet, in other words, we would have the building, the temple being 120 feet, these are approximate, of course, long, 40 feet wide, and 60 feet in height. And as we work our way through this chapter, we'll learn that there were uh, the structures on the sides of the temple on three sides that were three stories in height. Verse 3, And the porch before the temple of the house, 20 cubits, approximately 40 feet, the same uh, width as the, the temple, the house, was the length thereof according to the breadth of the house, the temple, and 10 cubits, 20 feet, was the breadth thereof before the house. So uh, the, the porch in front the in, served as the entry to the temple, if you will, was 40 feet, the same width as the building itself, and then approximately uh, 20 feet uh, extending out from the temple itself. Verse 4, And for the house he made windows of narrow lights. Now, there's a lot of disagreement among scholars of what this is talking about, but we'll learn that the three storage structures surrounding three sides of the temple were not as tall as the temple itself. And these narrow lights, I think, were uh, uh, windows that were placed after the roof of the three-story buildings on the sides between them and the roof of the temple, you had windows on both sides which would allow light uh, and air into the temple. And also you have to remember they had an altar of incense burning. And anytime you have burning, you have smoke. So they had to have a way to uh, ventilate the smoke out, uh, which would have been through these narrow windows. Verse 5. And against the wall of the house he built chambers, these are rooms, round about against the walls of the house, round about, uh, both of the temple and of the oracle. Now the oracle is the holy of holies. And he made chambers round about. In 1 Chronicles 28, 19, we learn that the design of the temple was not of man. It was God who wrote this design on David, and then David communicated this design to Solomon. Verse 6, the nethermost chamber, or the, the furthest chamber back, was five cubits broad, uh, this being an internal lower floor, 
and the middle uh, floor was six cubits broad, and the third floor, if you will, was seven cubits broad. Now we're talking about the, the, the three-story side structures around the temple. For without in the wall of the house he made narrow rests, or rebates, round about that the beam should not be fastened in the walls of the house. And this is really uh, becomes difficult to understand. Let me explain a bit. And again, we're talking in this last verse about the three storage structures that were on three sides of the temple. Of course, there weren't the structures on the porch, the front porch side. But as you went higher, and it, it makes no sense to many people why you would start in the first level and it would be five cubits, the rooms would be five cubits across. The second level, there's six cubits across. And the highest level, there's seven cubits across. And the explanation for this is found in the fact that the, the walls uh, at this time were constructed wider at the bottom. And as they got taller, they got narrower. You had to have a wider wall to support the weight uh, of the, the upper chambers, if you will. So as you went up and you had less wall, the rooms became wider. And I hope that carries across. Verse 7. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in the building. No uh, steel or iron tools were allowed to be making uh, noise, if you will, at the site of the temple. And you might say, well, well that sounds kind of silly. I wonder why that was. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, uh, God instructed that when you construct an altar, you're to use whole stones. You're not to have axe or iron tools uh, utilized to make stones utilized in the altar of burnt offering. Verse 8, the door for the middle chamber was in the right side, on the southern side of the temple, of the house. And they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle into the third. Now what this is talking about is that if you had uh, a drawing of the temple from the side, you could see the three stories uh, next to the temple. Uh, then in the middle of that, approximately uh, 60 feet from the front, in other words halfway between the front and the back of the length of the building, you would have a doorway. And then there was a door, through the doorway you had a spiral staircase that went up first to the second floor and then eventually to the third floor. Verse 9, so he built the house and finished it and covered the house with beams and boards of cedar. Now we're not talking about the interior which begins in verse 15. Uh, this is talking about the roof. Now these rooms that we were been talking about, uh, what were they used for? Well, you had some storage uh, obviously needed. Uh, you had the treasuries of the temple that uh, would have been probably in a most secure place for obvious reasons. Uh, the original mosaic tabernacle was stored in one of these rooms, chambers of the house of God. Verse 10, and then he built chambers against all the house, five cubits high, and they rested on the house with timber and cedar beams so that they wouldn't uh, intrude on the sanctuary itself. In other words, piercing, penetrating the walls into the temple. Verse 11, and the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, now how the Lord chose to communicate to Solomon this time is not written. I think most likely the same that uh, he communicated to him in chapter 3 in a dream. Verse 12, concerning this house which thou art in building, 
if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. The promises made to David in First Chronicles uh, chapter 22, verse 10, and Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 13. You, if you do your part, God always keeps his promises as long as we meet the conditions. Verse 13, And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11, And I will set my tabernacle among you uh, and my soul shall not abhor you. Verse 14, so Solomon built the house and finished it. And again, he had tens of thousands of people helping him build this. And again, it's a very joyous time as people saw the, the permanent structure, the temple of God uh, coming into reality. Verse 15, now we be hearing about the interior of the building. And he built the walls of the house within with boards of cedar, both the floor of the house and the walls of the ceiling. And this probably uh, uh, means the beams of the ceiling. And he covered them on the inside with wood and covered the floor of the house with planks of fir. Again, most likely cypress wood. Verse 16. And he built 20 cubits on the sides of the house, the hindermost side, in other words, both the floor and the walls with boards of cedar. He even built them for it within, and even for the oracle, even for the most holy place. And what we're talking about here is that the, if you walked into the front of the temple from the porch, if you went all the way to the back of the temple, that's where you would find the Holy of Holies. And it was 20 cubits, approximately 40 feet, which would be a third of the total uh, interior length of the building if we had a 120 feet long building. And why would you call the Holy of Holies the oracle? Well, an oracle uh, it comes from the word like uh, uh, oratory, to speak. And from the Holy of Holies is where God spoke with the people of Israel. Not very many people were allowed to, would even see the interior of the Holy of Holies, uh, that reserved for the high priest. But through the Urim and Thummim, God spoke to the children of Israel. When there was a major decision about going to war or not going to war, uh, they would inquire of God with the Urim and Thummim. And from the Holy of Holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, uh, God would speak, uh, orate, to the children of Israel, thus the name Oracle, which simply is the same as the Holy of Holies. Well, truly a fantastic house for God. You know, I think it's an interesting study to compare the original Mosaic Tabernacle with the temple of Moses and also the temple uh, of the millennial age. But always remember there will be no temple in the eternity. Why? Because God, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the light thereof. You know, is this an important study, the, the temple? Well, I certainly wouldn't want to make a religion out of it, but all of God's word is given for inspiration, uh, for, for our learning. And, you know, uh, if, uh, if you are interested in this subject, we do offer a book through our library uh, here at the chapel called, entitled, uh, Solomon's Temple. It's written by E. Raymond Cap. You know, and I don't think man uh, can understand the divine wisdom and knowledge of God that he utilized in, in these instructions for the temple. But if you're interested, this book uh, by E. Raymond Cap, who is a well-known, well-respected biblical archeologist, uh, takes his ideas 
about what the biblical references mean, the ideas of other scholars, and puts forth some, some sketches, some drawings of what this all may have looked like. If you're interested, you might consider ordering that. We'll come back and finish the interior of the building and the completion of the house of God, the, the temple of Solomon. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word, the world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself, when were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question and you'd like to pose the question to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Uh, don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by uh, name. We teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. Uh, we'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're listening via, via shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Uh, always good to hear from you and quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We don't need the telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to talk with your Father. You know, you should be able to talk to Him just like He's your flesh Father. He's the, the closest relative that you have. and. Um, he's interested in you. He loves you. Uh, return his love with your love and adoration and, and talk to him through prayer. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, financial difficulties, uh, problem marriages, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up, we have DeForest in Wisconsin. Where do I find in the Old Testament prophecies uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the many, many places you can uh, read of his birth that he would come in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 7. It tells us a virgin shall conceive and you'll call his, and bear a son and you'll call his name Emmanuel. Uh, kind of the end of his life here on earth, the crucifixion in Psalm 22, verse 1 and the following verses. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1 and 9, also about the crucifixion. But, you know, most Bibles have a star following a verse that most scholars believe uh, means that that verse has a Messiah uh, connotation, a meaning of, of the referring to the Messiah. So uh, check your Bible and anywhere you find in the Old Testament a star at the end of the verse, uh, it refers to Christ. Carly in Ohio, uh, what brings me to my question? 
that brings me to my question, and thank you for your kind comments. How do you pray for a person who claims he's a Christian but harasses and ab abuses, not physically, and persecutes me yet does not see the error of his ways at all? This person was a family member but is still a part of my life. What do I do? I know I shouldn't cast my pearl before swine. You know, uh, what was it? Carly, God can change people. Uh, he can change people's heart. He can change their minds. So uh, pray for him and, and ask God to touch him and change him for the better. I don't know what part of your life this person has you, you didn't state or holds, but you know, you don't need nor should you take abuse or persecution. Being a Christian doesn't make you a second class citizen. So uh, pray for this person to change, but if he doesn't change, uh, again, I don't know what part of your life he is, but you don't have to put up with it. Marlo, and we don't know where Marlo is, thank you and God bless you and your family and the staff at Shepherd's Chapel for all you do feeding God's children. Well, thank you for remembering the staff and family. It's a tremendously hard-working group of people, but it's a labor of love. Get to your question. God's word says Antichrist will set up his throne in Jerusalem and will be in power for five months. Revelation chapter 9, the season of the locusts, five months. So he will be on earth for a while and will be saying to anyone who believes he is going to fly people out of here uh, from earth. What do you think will be his excuse for flying people out of here or what will be the scenario? Safety from a natural disaster, disease, alien enemy, etc. He won't need to come up with any reason. You see, uh, most Christians are set up hook, line, and sinker to swallow the rapture. He, he won't need to have a reason. They're going to be lining up saying, where's the line for me to, to rapture out of here? Uh, you see, they're taught that the rapture will fly away to avoid the tribulation of Antichrist. And they see what the problem is. They don't know that the one claiming to be Jesus Christ is the Antichrist. The whole world's going to be deceived except for those written, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 will document that. Michael from Oklahoma, I have a question. How many times to have communion a year? Thank you and God bless you uh, and the staff. Again, thanks for remembering the staff. You can take communion, Michael, as often as you feel the need. You know, we don't take communion here at the chapel on a weekly or a monthly basis so that the communion doesn't become a meaningless ritual. Um, but again, you yourself can obtain a, a copy of the uh, Passover or Fall Fellowship communion uh, CD or DVD and, and take that with your communion as often as you feel the need. AJ in Georgia, do we pray to God the Father or Jesus Christ? In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches the disciples. They asked him, how do we pray? And he began his prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Christians should pray uh, to our Heavenly Father, but always uh, give yourself credentials as a Christian by asking and praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Mark from Oklahoma, were there cavemen? Thanks for your lessons. Well, you're welcome and glad you enjoy studying God's Word. No, uh, God created man in His image. He created man the same, and they looked the same way then as they look now. Uh, he did not create man in the image of an ape, which is what 
and a caveman uh, looks like to me. And there's a reason for that. They found the jawbone of an ape and then they build the shape of the head around that one piece, the jawbone, out of clay and come up with, lo and behold, a caveman. This is what the caveman looked like. Uh, no such thing. God created man. He created him just like he looks today for the most part. David in Michigan, what do you think of a church having a pig roast? I thought a pig was unclean animals. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 7, swine is unclean. It's unhealthy for people to eat pork. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 65 verses 4 and 5, uh, God tells us what he thinks about those uh, who are holier than thou and those who eat swine's flesh. Both are like smoke in his nose. Very annoying. Steve in Washington, what is heathenism? Is it a person who doesn't believe in God? Okay, Steve, in the Old Testament, uh, a heathen was anyone who was of a nation other than uh, uh, Israel. Uh, a heathen was also a, a Gentile, if you will, in that regard, uh, that practiced idolatry, who worshiped gods other than Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. A Gentile that resided with Israel and worshiped Yahweh wasn't treated as a heathen. They were treated uh, like all other uh, Israelites. In the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, uh, we learn that those who uh, believe on Jesus Christ are Abraham's seed. Uh, Itabia, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm, that must be Italia. I don't know. You know, Illinois. Daniel 11:24. does this apply to today? It applies to the not-so-distant future, in my opinion, and that verse is prophecy that the Antichrist uh, will come into power peacefully and prosperously. Uh, he'll pay for everything. He'll pay your bills. He'll pay off your, your car loan. All you have to do is worship him which God's elect won't do. We, we know that to worship Him is an abomination to our Heavenly Father. We're going to stick around and wait for the true Messiah to return, and we're going to stand and witness against the Antichrist as we're delivered up. Revelation chapter 2, 9 and 3, 9. Pat in Michigan, what and how did Satan do in the first earth age exactly to draw one-third of God's children away from God? Is it written? Well, by deceiving them to follow Him rather than God. The fact that He did draw one-third away you can read of in Revelation uh, chapter 12 where uh, the great dragon, that's Satan, uh, and he drew one-third of the stars of heaven. The stars of heaven often referred to uh, as uh, the children of God. The children of God are also referred to as the stars of heaven. Chris in California, Matthew 24:40. Two men will be in the field. One is taken and one is left. Two women grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one left. Are the ones taken, taken by the devil, Satan? Yes, you've got it. They're, they're the ones who are deceived into believing that there is a rapture theory. The ones who stay in the field working are God's elect. Uh, we're not going to worship the Antichrist. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, witness against the Antichrist. And you follow Mark chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Uh, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another commits adultery. Now if a person is to be forgiven of his or her sin, 
he or she must repent. However, if he or she remains married to the other person, the second spouse, in other words, then the repentance seems insincere and he or she continues to be in, in an adulterous relationship. Please explain and thank you very much. Well, you know, I'm glad God is the judge and not you, uh, Chris. Uh, you would have divorcees, I guess, be second-class citizens the rest of their lives. That's not what the, the Bible teaches. Uh, you know, there was a woman who uh, was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And they brought her to Jesus and said, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And they didn't bring the man. I wonder where he was. But Jesus didn't answer. He kneeled down and he started writing in the dirt. And as he wrote in the dirt, one by one, the accusers got up and left. And I know Jesus, it's not written what he wrote in the dirt, but I'm sure he wrote, uh, Sam, I know what you were doing last Wednesday night with Witta Jones. Uh, and Sam got up and left. Bill, I know what you did, and Bill got up and left. And then finally he, Jesus stood and said, Woman, where are thy accusers? And she said, I know not. And he said, uh, neither do I, but go forth and sin no more. In other words, Jesus forgave the woman. Once a sin is forgiven, Chris, it's blotted out. It's gone. It's like it never existed. So uh, can uh, someone be forgiven of adultery? Yes, it's not the unforgivable sin. Leola in New Jersey, please explain Zechariah chapter 5 verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, a verse about the flying roll. May the Lord bless you and your family and also your staff and ministry. Well, thank you for that, and he certainly is a blessing all. Chapter 5 of Zechariah, the roll, the flying roll, is a scroll, if you will. And a scroll is what uh, they wrote books on. The Bible, the Torah, was written on a scroll, a roll of papyrus or leather or a combination of both. But the flying roll of Zechariah chapter 5 is a scroll, uh, not that the Word of God is written uh, on. This scroll has God's curse on it, the one in Zechariah chapter 5, and the curse is on those who steal thieves, in other words, or those who sweareth falsely, those who lie. And that curse is written on that flying scroll of Zechariah chapter 5. Todd in Louisiana, uh, Genesis chapter 4 verse 17, Cain and Enoch, and then Genesis 5 18, Jared 162 and begat Enoch. Is this the same person? Please clear this up for me. Or did they just repeat the name a lot in those days? Very important to take note of that difference. And you say, what is the main difference? If you know God's Word, you know that in Genesis chapter 4, you have the genealogy, the seed line, the family, if you will, of Cain. In Genesis chapter 5, you have the family, the genealogy of Adam. They are different, and there are uh, two men named Enoch. And you have another question. The next question, did Lot sleep with his two daughters just because the men of Sodom and Gomorrah did not exist, and they became pregnant, bore two sons, which became two of the tribes of Israel. You're confused there. Uh, the, 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 the sons of Lot were Ammon and Moab. They were not two tribes of Israel. They did go on to found nations of Adamic peoples, but they weren't tribes of Israel. You continue, but Lot sleeping with his daughters, isn't that incest that is against what God believes in? How can this be? Did God allow this only once? Because of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, there were no men left in the world or that country or city 
I'm confused, just you are, uh, especially about uh, Ammon and Moab being tribes of Israel. Uh, the law of incest, uh, uh, Todd, was not given until the time of Moses, which was centuries and centuries after the time of Lot. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18 uh, lists the marriages that are forbidden, in other words, incest, but again, that was centuries after the time of Lot. Charles in Georgia, John 18, 15, could this have been Judas coming back for his money? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it was either Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. Why? Because they were known by the high priest, meaning they were probably members of the Sanhedrin. And you follow John 1.25, what prophet is John talking about in this verse? And I think it points back to verse 23 where John said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, as said the prophet Isaiah. That's the prophet Isaiah in the Greek form. Alice in Arkansas, please tell me where I can find the scripture that talks about the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the construction of the Ark of the Covenant you can read about in Exodus chapter 25. Where the Ark is today, uh, you can read about in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. John was taken to heaven in the spirit, and the Ark of the Covenant is there. I think it was taken with Elijah. Uh, in the whirlwind that took him. I'm out of time. I want you to know that I do love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. Your Heavenly Father loves you for it as well, that you take time to read the letter that He wrote to you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, though, you stay in His Word every day, and your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.